Hello, everybody, and welcome to this month's installment of Office Hours presented by Top Resume. Top Resume is the largest resume writing service in the world, and you can request a free resume review at any time by going to topresume.com. I will be your host today, and as always, my name is Amanda Augustine, and I'm a career advice expert for Top Resume. I'm a certified career coach and resume writer, and we are here today to talk about the biggest job search mistakes that employers are reporting seeing uh, recent college grads make. So these are the things that are really holding you back when you're trying to find that job. We're going to say it's right out of college, but honestly, I think the mistakes that um, we're going to talk about apply to a much larger population. Um, it's not only those people who've graduated in the first few years, but it really applies to anybody. I'm really excited today because we are also going to be joined by a co-host who I will introduce momentarily. A um, couple things I want to throw out there. If you haven't already, please like Top Resume's Facebook page so you find out about our upcoming events. Next month, we're talking about networking, for instance. So if you want to know when that's happening and what's going on, be sure to like Top Resume's page. Also, um, we are running this ongoing monthly contest for a free resume makeover. And I'm gonna pull this up just so you can see it for a second. It's really cool. We are using a new technology today, so I'm gonna say already, bear with me. But I'm very excited because if you check this out, if you go to topresume.com, resume makeover, uh, and my lovely colleague Jenna will also put the URL into the comments below. Uh, definitely, if you are thinking about rewriting your resume, if you already did and it's not working for you, um, submit to this contest, enter to win, and once a month we pull a name out of the hopper, we assign them to one of our senior resume writers, and they receive a free resume uh, makeover. So it doesn't get much better than that. I'm going to take that down now, come back on. All right, I'm very, very excited for our guest today. Um, this is somebody I've known for just about five years now, I believe. Um, and we've worked together in the past, had a great time. Um, his name is Danny Rubin. Danny Rubin is an award-winning author on business communication skills, a former TV news reporter. He now teaches students and working professionals how to write, network, and speak with confidence. And I got to say, guys, he has this fantastic book out. Um, I'm a huge, huge fan of it. I offer it and, and suggest that all of my um, clients, particularly those who have graduated in recent years, um, pick it up. If you want to learn how to write the right email, how to create the right communication, this book is golden. Highly recommend checking it out. And with no further ado, I would like to bring Danny Rubin onto the broadcast. He's coming on momentarily. Hello. Hey, Danny. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. I'm in here. I'm in the room. We're good. You're good to go. Am I getting awesome. a thumbs up from Jenna? Yes. Excellent. Okay. Excellent. All right. First technical hurdle over. <laughs> Excellent. <Yep. laughs> um, so, Danny, why don't you tell us a little bit about what you've been up to lately? Because I think it's really exciting. Yeah, well, it's crazy that you said we've, we've been friends and working together for five years. That is crazy how time can go. But that's true. And we've both been working hard on our respective careers, helping each other along the way of being resources to each other. And that's a huge part of the game is, you know, building relationships and they get better and better over time. And so for me, I'm actually in the sixth year of what I've always considered to be a, a side hustle, which I think every uh, young professional should find one sort of locate what they love to do and make time for what they enjoy off the side of their desk or, in their free time, it's the best way to really grow and develop into who you're supposed to be. And so I've, as you said, I started my career right out of college as a TV news reporter, did that for a few years, enjoyed some aspects, didn't love all of the negative reporting and constant weather reporting. And so I just said, you know, this is not going to be my end all, but I never lose lessons. 
I might leave an opportunity if it's not the best fit, but I don't lose the lessons along the way. And so now what I do is I teach young people and working professionals of any age how to use really classic principles of journalism and communication to advance their own careers, uh, whether it's the job application process or promoting a, your own business. The words we use in our emails, in our face-to-face -face conversations and phone calls, they make the difference. They open doors. If we use them properly, they can lead to new opportunities, build relationships and trust with people. So I see time and again the value of teaching people how to use our words properly. And so I started with a personal blog. It has evolved into an idea for a book, which you referenced. And thank you for always sharing my book, Wait, How Do I Write This Email?, with uh, with people that's evolved to another book on writing for entrepreneurship that has evolved into curriculum to help teach students in various school settings high school college and beyond how to learn these lessons in the classroom so it's been this incredibly organic process where i continue to get closer and closer to the work that i'm supposed to do which is to educate people on how to communicate properly. That's where I've meant, been meant to be all along. And after six years of grinding away, I feel like I'm finally sort of rounding into form and looking ahead at the next you know, 25 years of my career, hopefully 30, whatever, and saying like, I've sort of found my niche and found my groove, but it didn't come easily. And that's an important lesson too. I think that's such a great point because that's what we're here to do today is help those who are maybe graduating in the next month or so, or even if you've graduated in the past few years and you still don't feel that you're necessarily in a job that's taking you towards the bigger dream, the bigger goal. It might be that you don't know what that goal is yet, but you know what it's not. Okay. It could, exactly. I 100% I didn't know. Mine has completely been this this evolution or this roller coaster over time. And I think a lot of people do experience that. So whether you know what you want and you don't know how to get there or you're still trying to struggle, you're still struggling to figure out how how to figure that out in the first place. We're here to help you avoid some of the mistakes that are going to sabotage those efforts over time. That's right. So, if you're just joining us, my name's Amanda Augustine. I'm the career advice expert for Top Resume, the largest resume writing service in the world. You can request a free resume review at any time by visiting resume or topresume.com. And today I'm joined by award-winning author, Danny Rubin. We're here to talk about what are some of the biggest job search mistakes uh, recent college grads make that are really holding them back. And so just to give you all a little understanding of how did we come up with this list, and we are going to focus on the top five, though um, there will be some extra material on Top Resume's site that's going to go into the full list. Uh, we reached out to hiring managers, HR professionals, recruiters, career service professionals, and basically said, hey, tell us, what are, what are the mistakes you're seeing college grads make that are, you know, kind of like, you know, fingernails on a chalkboard. They're the things that drive you crazy and you truly believe they're the habits and the mistakes that are holding them back from the job search process. So we really want to talk today about what are those top five? Why do myself and Danny think they made the top five? And then what can you do to try and avoid those mistakes so you're not necessarily holding yourself back and you are more likely to find the right job and land it sooner rather than later? Um, Danny, anything you want to add at this point, just going into that? Yeah, you know, I think it's incredible the what the list showed, what the survey results of yielded, and what, what it says about what hiring managers want. And then it's amazing what students are being taught, taught or not taught in the high school classroom, whether if they're going straight into a vocational, a trade, or if they're in college and going out into, you know, after a four-year degree, these are skills that young people must learn and they're not really being taught adequately enough yeah. because it's setting them up for failure or to for setbacks to feel like they're not worthy of an opportunity where if they had just learned how to present themselves differently, it could have changed everything. So that's really my passion and my pursuit. So I love to have the chance to talk about it today. 
100%. I remember there was a while back, and this is going back a few years, but I remember I was at a networking event talking to another individual who was really passionate about how do you prepare college students to be really ready for the workforce and not just a diploma in their hand. And he was telling me about some study that had been done where they had pulled students, professors, and employers who were all, you know, uh, in connection with the, or in contact with one another, that were all connected and basically pulled this big group and asked um, all three groups, are these college seniors ready for the working world? The students didn't think they were, the employers didn't think they were, <laughs> the professors did. <laughs> and that's a, and, no, that, and that's that, a concern. And I that think says, um, yeah. a lot of what you're doing, Danny, um, and the curriculum that you're building for colleges uh, is to kind of fill that void and add that extra class, whether it's in career services or it's its that's own right. listing that you can sign up for as an elective to help prepare people for that. That's exactly um, right. It's a gap. So, it's a void in the market. It is. It is, and it's one, it's awesome that you're able to fill it, to be quite honest. So let's get into this sucker. I'm yep. going to hide our lovely little captions for the moment so that I can pull these up and read them out to everybody. All right, so what are the biggest job search mistakes that are holding you back? And again, we specifically asked, what are you seeing people who are, have recently entered the workforce? But I think they're universal. So if you are more than a few years out of school, this is still relevant, 100%. Totally. So let's start with the first one. And I think this this, to this squarely falls in, in your area of expertise, Danny. But the number one mistake, 67% of over 250 people who we polled said inappropriate or ineffective written communication. And this had everything to do with the voicemails you're leaving, the emails you're sending, the replies you're giving, the text messages you're returning, anything that had to do with written communication. Um, so maybe not your voicemails, but everything else, all the written communication that was going back and forth with either a recruiter or even a networking connection. So I'd love for you to talk about this a little bit. You know, what is deemed inappropriate or ineffective because I think a lot of people out there aren't aware that this is a mistake they're making and I don't think a lot of employers are going out of their way to say I just missed you because your email was 100% inappropriate right yeah well I'm not surprised that that's the number one answer that's the number one gripe that I hear from because I'm sitting kind of in the middle of the classroom and the business world and I'm hearing it from both ends and the employers and the, the instructors both say the same thing. The emails I'm getting from students look like text messages. And I'm not here to point fingers or blame anyone for how they communicate. We are the product of what we have learned and what we've, been, what we've seen others do, what we've been taught, what we think is appropriate. And so I'm not here to tell you that you're a bad person if you have written an email with all lowercase words or you just – launch into a message without saying hi to the person in an email, just abruptly getting into what you want them to do for you. But what I am here to tell you is that the classic rules of communication still very much matter in the business world. And that's why it's important to learn, to take time to learn and observe proper ways of structuring, particularly email correspondence, how you address people in your emails. Do you put Mr. or Ms.? Do you do a first name? There are some rough guidelines for how to address people. What do you put in your subject line to capture their interest, to make them want to open your email? How do you make sure that your main point of what you want to accomplish in that message is at the top so the person is not searching around looking for your main point? Sometimes people are very hesitant to ask for things in, in email, so they'll put their ask, like a coffee chat or an informational interview, they'll put it at the very bottom because it's almost like, okay, thanks for listening to me. Oh, by the way, could I have that meeting with you? And that's not assertive. And it's, it's also distracting and annoying for busy people to search around a message to say, what does this person want from me? There is a structure that all emails that are in the business world must follow. And we can get into more of the strategy within these different email scenarios or writing scenarios as we go along. But the point is, the classic rules matter more than ever because most people don't understand how to send a proper email to 
an employer or a mentor or someone in the business world. And if you can do it properly, it gives you a major leg up right away because you're going to be judged on the words you use, like it or not. That's just the way it is. Yeah. Yeah. No, I 100% agree. Um, it, it's so interesting because I think, and this applies to every aspect of the job search process. If you're looking for a job, I don't care if you're looking to go into finance or you're looking to go into tech, whatever it is, when you're going to become a job seeker, you automatically become a marketer. And you have to get in that mindset that the resume you present, the LinkedIn profile, if someone Googles your name, the online presence, and again, your e email communication, those are all marketing tools and should be treated as such. So sure. if anybody is a marketer, or is getting a degree in marketing or has any experience in that area, take a step back and think of yourself as the most valuable product you are ever going to market. And are you being consistent? Um, and is the communication you're using, is it the tone that you want to represent you as a professional? And think about what are some of the marketing techniques that you've learned in school, or you can learn, frankly, you can go on to edX, you can go on to Coursera, I think everybody should should uh, do one course on marketing 101 just to get a sense of the principles because they're going to apply to how you market yourself um, when you're looking for a job and even when you're networking. So I think that's, that's right. really important. When, you know, when it, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, you know, that there's there are two main themes that I want to impart during our, our talk. And that is to your point of being a marketer. What I want people to learn out of our conversation is. You're not a job seeker, you're a storyteller, and mm. we'll get into what that means. Yeah. And you're also not just a job seeker, you're a giver. And I'm going to explain what that means and the different ways you can show selflessness in the business world and how that can open more doors than ever it ever could if you just talked about yourself and, yeah. and put the focus on yourself. So storytelling and giving, if you can understand those concepts coming out of this conversation, it will change a, a lot of your fortune in the job market and the world will start to shift a little bit in your favor because you know how to approach people the right way. So we'll just keep that in the back of your mind and we'll, we'll dive into those topics as, as these uh, number one, two, three, four, five roll down the list. I love it. I love it. Yeah. I love the storytelling. Um, I can't wait to get into a bit of cover letters with you in a little bit because I think that's one of the best techniques. I've used your article on that over and over and over again with clients great. because I think it's just Thank such you. a great technique um, and it totally spins uh, the the approach to the cover letter and makes yeah. it not a boring document. It makes it up. Makes it so much better. So at a high level for for you, Danny, we, we talked about, obviously, if you're writing an all lower case, if you're not taking the time to be thoughtful with your subject line, um, if you're burying what a marketer would call the call to action, what's the ask? What's the, what's the main thing you want the reader to do? If you bury that at the end of your email, that that's a mistake. Um, not opening with, with a proper introduction. Um, are, off the cusp, are there any other major mistakes that you see people making? I, I think there's definitely something about, you know, this pretense of knowing the person when you don't, that that can kind of drive. Uh, yeah. You can find out a lot about people online, which is great. You want the background, but if it feels like you stalk them and you're talking about their, their puppy pictures or something like that, that can be a little awkward. But um, being a little too familiar, are there any other major mistakes that you're seeing that are really inappropriate or ineffective when it comes to the written communication? And let's just say with emails for, um, to start with. Well, well, to your point, I certainly don't advocate anybody goes and like digs up family photos of somebody they have not met. But there is a huge value. And what I just said a minute ago, which is to be a giver. Now, let me give you an example of what is appropriate and totally above board and how you can open many, many doors that would have otherwise stayed locked shut. So let's say you want to ask for an informational interview. I've seen many emails come across my desk where people reach out and they want to intern or they want a job. And basically the email has the same structure. Hi, my name is so-and-so. I'm about to graduate from X school. I have a degree in marketing, public relations, journalism. I'd love to know if your team is hiring. Please let me know. Now, what gets me excited about that email? 
pretty much nothing because the first thing that they didn't do, which we can talk about in a little bit, is they've given me no proof of their own performance. Mm -hmm. I have no examples to go on. I know nothing about your talent or even just interest in this field. So if yep. you have stuff to share, you got to give me a link. You got to take me to a portfolio. I got to get my head around it. But the other thing that virtually no one does, I'm telling you out of 99 or 100 emails like this, maybe one out of that 100 is going to do this. And you listening right now out there in Facebook land could be that one. Before you write to an employer, you need to go on their website. You need to visit their website. You need to go to a page like Recent News or blogs or press releases or their LinkedIn profile. This is readily available. This is not looking up their ninth grade yearbook and that seeing what clubs they were in. Okay, this is straight up like five minutes of homework and you got it. I want you to read something interesting, not just their about us page or their mission statement. That's not good enough. I need you to read something real, something that they've done recently they're proud of, an award they want, an initiative they finished, a partnership, something tangible. Read it all the way through, process it, stick it in your head. And then I want you to go back to your email and say, I was reading up on your website about Project X or Project Y. And I found it so interesting that you did X or Y. And here's why I found it interesting. Take two or three sentences and show you've done some studying on that company, on that employer even. It is validation for what the company is doing. It makes your email authentic right out of the gate. It shows you actually do care what the company is doing. You're congratulating them. And as the word I used prior, you are giving your time and attention before you can ever expect the employer to care about you. Yep. That's how the world works. And I'm not telling you to spend six weeks studying a company before you pen that email. I'm saying take literally five minutes yeah. and just show that you've done some homework and you're validating them. That move will open many, many doors because it's a warm, inviting, authentic way to introduce yourself. It's disarming and it is the proper way to make friends. Really, this is stuff that we learn in the sandbox and I'm translating it to the business world and nothing really changes throughout our lives. It's how you treat people and that's what gets people excited and want to talk to you because they say, that's a young person with some poise. Let's, I'm going to write them back. I am intrigued. I think there's a couple things that are very interesting there. This is also a great technique when you're getting ready to go on any interview. And in fact, if you have a few days before the interview, set up a Google News alert for that company, for yes. the people that are going to be you're going to be interviewing with and see what pops up so that you have something just like you're trying to build rapport and catch someone's eye in an email. You want to do the same thing when you meet them face to face for an interview. And that's such a great way to go about it. Um, I'm going to ask Jenna if she hasn't already. Um, there's a great article that Danny wrote on his site and we've also published on our site about the networking email that works every time. And I think that really kind of lends itself to the to the um, informational interview that you were talking about. And for anybody who's not familiar with informational interviews, particularly if you're looking to change careers or you are new to the workforce, informational interviews become your very best friend. Um, and basically, you're not asking for a job, though that would be a really nice end result or consequence after the fact, but you're really gathering information, learning from their pearls of wisdom to help guide you in either um, refine your job search, identify what's the right job for you to start with if you want to get to, you know, X, Y, and Z further in your career or enter or break into that industry and also understand, you know, what do you need to learn? What should you be positioning on your resume? What should you be hyping up and talking about that they're going to find true value in? Um, so we also have an article on the number of questions you can ask when you do land that, in, um, that informational interview. And I highly recommend taking a look at that. Um, for anyone who's just joined us, my name is Amanda Augustine. I am joined by award-winning author Danny Rubin, and we are here to discuss the top five job search mistakes employers are reporting recent grads are making during the job search that frankly is really holding them back and kind of sabotaging their efforts. So we went through the first one, which is this idea of inappropriate or ineffective written communication. And frankly, I think we could talk an entire hour just on that one. <laughs> 
and we can touch back on that. And Jenna, feel free to let me know if there are any really relevant questions popping up. Um, I didn't mention this earlier, but for anybody who's joined us for these live chats before, please, if you have a question, just enter it in the comments below. Um, if it's relevant to the conversation here and now, Jenna will let us know and we'll discuss it. If not, you can also hold it till the end. But as the questions come up in your head, feel free to write them out in the comments section. And we're going to try and tackle as many of those as we can over the course of this one hour live chat. Um, so we talked about uh, inappropriate, ineffective written communication. I feel like this is going to uh, kind of trickle into some of the other ones that are on this list as well, because I know there's a lot more we could talk about. But going to number two, again, very similar in the theme, very similar. This concept of being too informal with hiring managers. And if we looked at the full answer that employers were choosing from, it was being informal. It was everything from how you were addressing a hiring manager. Um, again, the communication, less written, more face-to-face. -face. Uh, even how you treated the receptionist when you were waiting for an interview. Um, how you behaved at networking events. And even how you were dressed. How did you show up for an interview? So it really ran the gamut. And the theme here is that, hey, we have a certain standard in our minds and you're not meeting it. And so let's try and unpack that one a little bit. So um, how do you know if you're being informal? If I, Again, I think this is one of those where a lot of people are not actively going out of their way, trying to be um, what an employer is deeming inappropriate or informal, but they're not necessarily aware that they're not meeting this, this unwritten expectation. So are there some clues or hints um, to help somebody understand if mm, perhaps you need to take it up a couple notches? Well, look, this is when we get into the world of soft skills and Sometimes they're easier to identify than others. They're oftentimes very subtle or very nuanced how we interact with people and how they perceive us. And there are a million little moments where we could we have done it better? Could we have tightened it up? And usually it's, it's always, you know, yes, we can always behave a little bit better than we did. And the general rule is, you know, walk into that networking event, walk into that interview like your life depended on it. And if you have that mindset of just like, I'm all in, then you will generally eliminate a lot of the little subtleties that people could say were inappropriate or, you know, not the greatest look for yourself if you just come in there with your game face on. But I'll give you an example of, to your point of even impressing the receptionist as you go through a job application process. So here's a real life situation that we all go through. You apply for a job and maybe they say they'll get back to you with a next step uh, decision in a, in a week. You haven't heard back. So what are you going to do? You decide you're going to call the office and check in. Well, if you call and you want to talk to John Doe, the hiring manager or the vice president, every time the receptionist picks up and you say, hi, is John there? And then the receptionist has to say, may I ask who's calling? And you say, oh, yeah, 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 sorry. And every time you do that, you do not introduce yourself. Then it's very possible at the decision time that John Doe walks out of his office and says, hey, who did you like? Because basically it's like, who do you want to have around us nine hours a day? Yeah. And if they say, you know, I didn't like that person's phone etiquette. That could be the decision maker right there. You could have yeah. done everything else great. So if that's why it's important to learn these skills while you're before you start applying everywhere Definitely. and to really process each step of this and understand, am I putting my best foot forward? Am I communicating properly? And these skills can be taught, but that you must focus on them. You have to think for a second about what you're saying, what you're writing, and you can't just start letting things fly out the window without a lot of regard for what they say or how they might be perceived. So it's very hard to pin down every single little sort of social grace and make sure that we're at the top of our game. But I promise you that if you dress well and you show that you're trying hard, you can overcome a lot of that because your earnestness will come through and that's worth everything. 
Yeah, I think there's there's a few things you said there that I think are incredibly important. Um, one thing that I've always heard recruiters repeat over and over again is that when they have two candidates with a similar skill set and all things are equal, the one who seems genuine, the one who seems genuinely interested always. in the company, in the position, and is actually passionate about it, they're always going to be the one who gets the job. I mean, hands down, because you want somebody who who you know, you want to invest in, you want to place your bets in, on. Um, something else that I thought was very important is the fact that you, you specifically dwelled on the receptionist for a while. And I think people also need to remember that that's also part of the interview process. Um, uh, I want to say it's Tony Shea, but I could be getting his name wrong. The, the founder of Zappos, he is notorious for um, basically starting the interview process from the moment the person steps off a plane when they're flown out for an interview. And so um, the person who drives the car with the luggage is part of the interview process. They actually have to fill out an evaluation on everybody that they've they've driven. Um, the receptionist has that. to fill out a piece of the of, of the evaluation. Everybody's because it's not just what are you presenting when you're sitting in the room across the table from the person who you believe is making the final decision it's how are you treating everyone around you and not only are you kind and are you are, are you, but also are you professional so keep that in mind That's they right. don't call the receptionist the director of first impressions for nothing uh, there's definitely something to be said there so if you're sitting on your phone and, and BSing with a friend or um, you know really wrapped up in playing with your phone um, it's time to turn the devices off when you get into the when you get into the office. Um, that's one that I personally witnessed. I had a I had a candidate actually stop me mid sentence to answer a call, and it was not because their their wife was going into labor. Or there was a family emergency. A friend called, and he you know he got off the phone fairly quickly, but he didn't see anything wrong with that yeah. behavior. Um, and I think that's one thing is that. Um, most of the people I would assume we're talking to have grown up with a smartphone in hand. Um, and we're so used to it. It's the first thing we see in the morning, the last thing we see before we go to bed at night. It's an extension of our bodies in so many ways. And we honestly forget that it, it does need to be turned off. Um, there's a time and a place to play on your phone and talk uh, and talk on your phone and write emails. And it, it's definitely not appropriate during the interview process. For sure. So that's one to throw out there. You know, like for me, definitely wearing like an entrepreneur hat these days, trying to grow a business, like every opportunity for me is like live and die. Like I, I if I have an opportunity at a new, you know, business prospect or a new relationship, I am totally locked in because it's like, I don't know when the next one's going to come along and I don't treat it like there's just going to be another. And I think a lot of times job seekers walk in the room, especially if they maybe came from a great school or they really think that they are just great people or they're getting a lot of interest from employers. They're like, oh, let me just get this other interview out of the way real quick. Yeah. And that if you walk in with that mindset, you've pretty much already lost. And everybody matters. The receptionist, the custodian, the employer who you never had any intention of working there, but they might know somebody and they talk and it all adds up. So the second yeah, you step off the plane or outside the Uber and you walk in that door, it's go time. And But that's actually not go time. Go time starts well before when you're preparing for that moment. We were talking yeah. about preparing questions about the company, their successes, what they're working on, the employer's own background, preparing how you're going to answer their questions. Again, with this, you know, telling success stories and sharing your own work ethic. It really starts before the day even arrives. But when it does arrive, you're going to prove that you came prepared and this means a lot to you. And that's going to really show and make an impact on anybody in that room. 100%, 100%. Um, in terms of if you're not too sure if you're dressing appropriately um, for that sort of thing, whether it's a networking event or it's an interview, the one thing I'd say is the great advantage you have today, as opposed to those who were in the job market maybe 10 years ago or, or longer, is that you can look online. 
Um, you know, if it's not the first time the event's going on, there's always somebody that you can reach out to ask, or there's photos from previous events that you can look at. If you're going in for an interview, um, definitely do, do your due diligence. Um, there are so many companies who now have social media handles dedicated to just their recruitment efforts. And those typically like to show a lot of the behind the scenes, look, we had a happy hour, look how great we are as a company, or look at this cool thing we're doing. But they tend to show actual pictures and not just stock photos of what's going on in the office and use those as clues as to the appropriate way to dress. And what I always tell people is that assume um, that you should dress for an interview the way that someone you saw in those photos would dress up for an important meeting. So you always take it a step up. If they get to wear jeans and t-shirts every day, which a lot of companies do, frankly, at my company, you can do that. Um, you know, then for the guys that say, okay, well, nice tailored jeans that fit well, that are clean, that aren't crazily wrinkled with a good button down and a blazer, like take it up a notch. If they can wear jeans and a t-shirt, you want to take it up a notch for, for women. You know Huh. Oh, sorry, go ahead. I'll let you finish yeah, your go point. Go for it. I was just going to say for ladies, same thing. I mean, you can get away with a, a nice blouse and a blazer or or a dress that's, you know, an appropriate length and that sort of thing. But um, it's always take into account the company culture um, and use that to give you clues as to how dressed up or dressed down you should be. And always take it up one more notch than you think than, than you think you should, because it's always better to be a little overdressed than a little underdressed. It's, well, that's it's, for, for sure. Yeah. You know, the, I, I won't tell women what to wear. I don't really know that uh, world all that well or at all. Um, but here's what I'll say to, to guys who are listening. Um, I don't care what job you're applying for, uh, wear a tie. Just really? wear a tie. Yeah. Because, look, you have no idea what you're walking into. Fair and enough. And you don't know if that company is super cool and casual, but then, like, the CEO from Switzerland dropped in that day and he's in a tie. You have no idea what's about to happen. You don't know who you're going to meet. You don't know how you might get redirected, ping down the hallway this way, that way, who you're going to meet, pop into their office. Don't take chances. Dress up because you get one crack at this. And again, these are soft skills. You might think you look great in the blazer and the shirt, super cool, but someone might judge you on that because of how they think applicants should dress. So if it's your second, third interview and they say, hey, you know what, dress down next time, go ahead. But let them tell you that. Don't come in there trying to like match them because you're not them yet. You need to prove yourself to them. So for me, I would never take that chance. I would not try to, I, I will, let's have a little bit of disagreement here in our That's little chat. True. You know, I would not look at their photos online, their happy hours and say, I want to look just like them. I want to come in like, damn, this guy is serious. And even if they laugh at me in the tie, so what? It means they're laughing because I was so serious about it. I'd rather them laugh about that than laugh about me being underdressed. Oh, because you can only respect me for trying so hard. Okay. Yeah. Agree to disagree. I, I think, and one thing I have ended up telling a lot of people is bring it with you. Same thing with the blazer or not and that sort of thing. Yeah. Bring the extra things. If you walk into reception and realize it actually looks very inappropriate. You can always put it on. You can always take it off. So think about those things. You're going to have yeah. a work bag with you. You're going yeah. to have a bag with you. In some way, shape, or form, you can kind of cover your basis. Um, I do agree that you shouldn't just assume that you should look entirely like you've already gotten the job, but I do think you should look like you belong on the team and that you'd be a good cultural fit because the cultural fit is a, is a key element. But yeah, sure. you should always take it up a couple notches and don't assume that because they can get away with a t-shirt, you can do the same. So something to keep in mind there. Um, I'm going to move us along. If for anybody who's just joined us, my name is Amanda Augustine. I'm the career advice expert for Top Resume, the largest resume writing service in the world. You can request a free resume review at any time by visiting topresume.com. And I'm here talking with award uh, award winning author Danny Rubin about the top five mistakes employers, hiring managers, HR professionals, recruiters have reported uh, recent college grads making that frankly are sabotaging their job search experts. So moving right along, we're going to check off. We did one. We did two. Being too informal. Um, the next, and I think two, I got to say three and four really do go hand in hand. Um, 
So I'm going to pop them both up so we can talk about them because I think they're just so, and, and I'm looking at time. I want to make sure we have enough time for to open it up for questions. Um, so I'm going to throw them both up. I think I can do that. Let's see. Oh, maybe not. Number three is not asking enough or appropriate interview questions. But I think it goes hand in hand because directly below it with only one percentage point less was arriving unprepared for the interview. So let's just stick with number four and assume that number three we're going to work into there as well because it's all about this, this concept of not being prepared for the interview in terms of, I would assume, knowing about the company um, as well as being prepared to ask intelligent questions that, that are actually going to move your candidacy forward and not just, you know, fluff. Yep. Um, That's so right. I, Go ahead. Oh, okay. So, uh, yeah, I can. So you remember at the start, I said, I want the people watching to be storytellers and givers, right? If you do those two things, then all you can do is look back and say, I did the best job I possibly could. So when we talk about storytellers, before you come in that room, I want you to prepare three stories that you would want to share. Two of them relate to your work ethic and one is in your personal life. Something that just gives a little more insight into kind of who you are outside of work because they're hiring the total person and they want to have somebody they enjoy hanging out with basically. So the two stories about your work ethic, think hard about what you've done in previous jobs or in the college classroom, in a student organization, a part-time job, wherever it came from. Think about two moments where you faced obstacles, had to work through those obstacles to find a successful outcome. Identify those stories, practice sharing those stories out loud and not taking eight minutes to do it, to do it in like 60 to 90 seconds, tops. So when they inevitably ask you, why are you a good fit for this position or why are you interested in this position, you're going to fall back on those stories. So you'd be like, you know what? I really am interested in this field, but can I give you a quick example of something that I've done that proves I'm right for this job? They'll be like, sure. And then you're going to tell a story. And I promise you, the longer you talk, they're going to lean in and they're going to be captivated because everybody is by a story. They always want to know what happened next. How did it end? If you're in there telling stories that reflect well on your work ethic, you will walk out of that room and they'll say, wow, that was a strong applicant. And they're going to remember what you told them. And then if they ask you, you know, what do you like to do outside of work? You know, what do you do for fun? You have a story there too about a recent, you know, concert or trip you took or something interesting. So you're ready on both fronts. That's how you weave in this storytelling idea to your job interview. Now on the other side, being ready with questions, inevitably they're going to ask you two, one of two things. Do you have any questions for me? The worst answer is no, or yes. I think you answered everything. Or they'll say, have you had a chance to look at our website? Which is also a huge, like, talk about nails on a chalkboard, like, oh, because it's almost like a test. You know they're going to say no. Oh, I, I didn't have a chance yet. Oh, I meant to. Or, oh, after the interview, I, I'm going to look. I promise. Sorry about that. Well, that's an opportunity wasted. You should say, you should step right into that and be like, yep, I was on your website last night. I was reading about your projects. And actually, I had a question about one of your projects. They're like, okay. This person is for real. Kind of awesome. Yeah. They're like, uh, can we just hire you right now, please? Because we talked to like 20 other people and they're all just like, you know, breathing out of their mouth and they have nothing but they're only curious about like what's in it for them. You know, the typical questions, the salary, the benefits, the start date, my role, where am I going to sit? Who am I going to be with? It's like me, 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 me. And all that stuff matters. But in that moment, you have to be a giver. You have to say, you thought I was going to ask about salary. But actually, I'm asking about your projects and the role I might play in them or the direction of your company or how it fits into the larger picture. Like that is the next level game changing stuff that's going to make you head and shoulders above the competition. So you tell great stories. You ask great questions. You, you walk out of there and say, you say, I did the best I could. Love it. I, th I think there's something really um, there. There's a link that I'm going to ask Jenna to uh, share. We actually did a live chat a, a number of months ago specifically on interviewing. And so there is a document or an article there that literally goes through. Here's everything you should be prepping. Here's what you should be researching ahead of time. This is what you should have prepped. Um, I think the biggest thing about the storytelling is 
walking that fine line between preparing enough and remembering your major talking points so you don't stumble when you're trying to, to communicate that information and not memorizing it so you sound rehearsed boring. Because if you're reading, I think about this, I have a two-year-old. I read the same stories every single night to my two-year-old. I can close my eyes and I can recite every line to Pow Pow Fish and, and all these other books out there. Um, uh, and maybe the two-year-old doesn't remind, doesn't care as much, but if you can recite it with your eyes closed, chances are your voice isn't very exciting anymore. You don't sound well, that's true. So that's the true. delivery yeah. of your story is really important as well. The delivery of your answers and your questions are important. So keep that in mind that you definitely want to rehearse, especially if these things make you incredibly nervous. You want to go through and do a mock interview. Um, you know, I didn't even think of it, but uh, Top Resume does have a sister site, Top Interview. So if you want to have a professional do mock interviews with you, you can do that. Um, we have those resources available. But you want to get comfortable and you want to work out the kinks, but you also don't want to get to the point where you've memorized a short paragraph and it sounds like you memorized a short paragraph. Well, you know, let, let me just speak to that really quickly. That's a good point. So what often happens is we come we come in the interview and we want to like give this perfect note for note answer that we're hitting all these beautiful adjectives about what we do and how we operate. That's hard. And when you try to memorize perfect answers, you're going to fall on your face. If you come in there just ready to tell a story, like you're telling a buddy at the end of the day or your parents, like you're not going to believe what happened to me today. The words just come out because you're not rehearsed. You're just sharing an experience. The easiest thing to do is to share an experience with the next person. It's, it, I think it takes away the formality and the theatrics of it, like I have to perform and get every line perfect. Instead, it's just like, yeah, and then next this happened, and then next that happened. And that's a very natural way to communicate with people, and it's engaging and entertaining. And yeah. if they've had interview after interview all day, and you come in like a bard sharing great moments of your life, it's like you woke them up. Yeah. So I want people to not think about, oh, God, what if I miss a word? Just tell somebody what happened. You're not judged on – your exact diction and you know, the, it's just entertain me, prove to me you're worth it. Give me, tell me a great story and I'll believe you. There is no such thing as a perfect answer. And if you're trying to memorize a perfect answer, that's when you get into trouble. If you yeah. really want to practice something, and I think this falls back on, on some of the other complaints that the hiring managers expressed earlier in terms of inappropriate or unprofessional communication, what you want to avoid is either the slang terms that they don't understand. Uh, you know, <laughs> you don't use P PYT in the middle of an interview. Um, and, and also trying to avoid, and we're all guilty of it. I, I had a professor in college, oh, Dr. Rothberg. She used to sit there and put little strikes on your desk, and then you had to, you owed her a quarter for every one she put on your desk with chalk. Every time you said, um, every time you used a filler word. So every time you used like when it wasn't appropriate, um, those good things. Thing. If you want to clean up your communication, those are the things to practice. Don't yeah, practice true. trying to memorize the perfect answer because it doesn't exist. Yeah, just, just tell me a great story that demonstrates your work ethic. And you'll yeah. never have to use a single adjective in that interview. You'll never have to say, I'm hardworking and passionate and dedicated and a natural leader and blah, 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 blah. You'll never have to do it. That's why I say in the book, I have this little page that says it's called My Three Stories. So first of all, I encourage everyone to walk in the interview room with a pen and paper to take notes. It yeah. is not a weakness. It is a strength. Come in there with ready to take notes so that you're take because sometimes they're going to give you advice, maybe a redirect to another opportunity. Write it down right there. So you'll remember and you'll prove that you actually are listening. But also before you walk in, have three bullets there. Your three stories, like a quick line about each one so you can remember and remind yourself the stories you wanted to share. So in the moment, you don't freeze up and forget. You look down at your paper and say, oh, yeah, yeah, I wanted to share that story. There is no shame in that. It, again, shows preparation, and that wins the day in my book. It's yeah. not perfection. It's preparation that's going to make me want to hire you. Yeah. The one thing I will throw out there is do not write down your answers and bring your answers with you. Do, you can no. do that. You can have a cue. Yourself. You can have a list of questions you want to ask. Yes. We talked about number number uh, three was not asking enough for appropriate interview questions. Yes. It's Absolutely. 
due diligence. And we have a couple of links of lists of questions you can ask, because sometimes you will get into those marathon interview sessions where you're on, you know, interviewer number five. and You're like, God, man, I went through all my questions. I don't know. I, what am I going to ask this person? Always have a couple in your pocket that you could ask every single person, such as what has your experience been like at this organization or how did you come to work here and why do you still stay? Or I would love to get from each person I interview, how would you describe the company culture? Um, and that's a good one because you actually want to get multiple people's opinions. So if something is not lining up or the answers are wildly different, that's kind of a red flag for you. But it's also a question you can always have in your pocket that you could ask absolutely everyone. If I were to take on this job, um, what are the three most important things you would like me to do or succeed in by the end of the year to you know, help you achieve your goals? Something along those lines. Um, yeah. What are the top three you know, skills you're looking for in the person who, who takes on this role? Again, you can ask that to basically anybody. And if the answers are wildly different, that's also good information for you. And it's going to help true. you evaluate the role. Um, that's true. And I think I would say like if anybody, if you walk in the room with a, with like a pen and paper and questions ready, you're already in the final round in my book. So I'm like, this person is just different than, than the rest. Like if you're going to come in with that much preparation, it just shows your character to me. Yeah. And even if you don't have the best technical chops for the job, you can learn those, but it's the character. It's the work. A lot of employers say this, they'll teach you what they do inside their walls but they're looking for character. They're looking for the, those high quality people. So if you, if you can come in with that preparation ready, you're already gonna score a lot of points, whether or not you're the most capable at the exact line of work that they do. Yeah, and I think in, in terms of the arriving unpre unprepared, we also allow the employers to basically fill out a box of here, would you like to elaborate on your answers? And one that really stuck out to me, and you could tell these people have like chips on their shoulder at this point, they're saying, well, you know, a lot of these, a lot of these kids, you know, are walking in the door and, and you know, they're not taking it seriously or it's clear we're not a first choice and why right. are they my time, blah, blah, blah. And what I gathered from that was that I do agree that you should take on, you should take an interview and use it as a learning opportunity, even if you're not sold on the job, because it could change into something else as you're talking to them. Um, but yes. you want the practice. You don't want to practice your interview skills on the job you really, really want. But regardless of your reason for being there, you want to be genuine, you want to be interested, and you want to be prepared because you don't want to waste anyone's time. And you never know, that role might end up being a good fit for you once you get in there and learn more. So take everyone seriously. Um, and that's really what they're looking for. They just want to know that you, you truly care and you're not just showing up for the sake of showing up. Um, and, and that goes a long way. Again, we have a couple of links out there, both on the interview questions you can be asking, as well as what's the checklist of things to prepare so that not only do you feel confident walking into that interview room, but that you're demonstrating to the employer that you took the time and you actually care. Um, you know, so can I, um, I don't want to, I know we're running out of time, but can I tell a quick story about how I landed my first job? 60 seconds. <laughs> okay. 60 seconds. I went in, I wanted to be a TV news reporter one week out of college. I got an informational interview at the CBS TV station in my hometown. Informational. So he would probably look at my demo reel of TV stories from college, tell me I wasn't very good, send me to a smaller market. I'm sitting there in his office and I wore a tie. I dressed up and he looks at me. He's like, hey, uh, one of our reporters is out sick today. Uh, would you want to fill in and, and cover he goes, he looks at me, he says, do you have ice in your veins? And I said, yep. <laughs> he said, great. I'm going to give you a photographer. You're going to go to the naval base, which is in my hometown. It's a submarine is deploying out to sea. I want you to go cover that. If it's any good, maybe we'll put it on TV. So I went in for an informational interview. 20 minutes later, I'm in a station vehicle doing a news story. I've been out of school for one week. I went, I did the story the best I could. I brought it back. We edited it. He, he popped into the editing room, looked at it. He goes, okay, we're going to air it. And it was on TV that night at five o'clock. And I came back every day for three weeks on one day contracts. And at the, after three weeks, he hired me to a two year contract. So I came in there not expecting a job at all, expecting to be just sent on my way. Like 
Good for you. Thanks for dropping by. It turned into a job. You got to treat every day like it's like it's all you have because you don't know what's going to happen. And I was wearing that tie. I could go on television and I'm glad that I did that. I took that time to prepare because you just don't know. And that moment has changed my entire career trajectory. It led to the next job. The next job It's transformed my life. And I think that's important and that's going to lead. Um, that's a great segue into our final one. And just for everybody, I know that there are questions waiting. We're going to, Danny, do you have a few extra minutes? Can we, can we um, extend Q and a? Yeah. A few minutes. Yeah. We we're talkers. What can we say? Um, I think this is one that we hear over and over again. I remember I did a, I did a piece on this a long time ago. I think it was for Mashable maybe on, you know, about graduates needing to be self-sufficient and that sort of thing. But you get this, um, question all the time. Actually, if you receive our newsletter, topresume.com slash newsletter, I know it's going in this coming Monday's newsletter. Um, I am writing an article on, you know, how, how do I, how do I um, overcome the catch 22 of entry level jobs where it's an entry level job, but they require two years of experience. <laughs> um, I think when it comes to, um, we saw that the, that basically people are complaining that uh, candidates are applying to unrealistic or out of reach jobs, and this applies across the gamut. I mean, I've been hiring for many years now, and I mean the percentage of um, candidates who are applying to jobs that they're just not a fit for. It's it's kind of crazy. Um, uh, I, Danny shall be back momentarily. I'm going to pop him out and pop him back in. Um, but it's really, it's really crazy what, what happens, um, in, in terms of you're applying for jobs. You just want to hear back. You're so sick of the big black hole, but recruiters are also complaining on the other end and using these awful systems called applicant, applicant tracking systems to remove people who aren't qualified because they find that the overwhelming number of people who apply are not meeting the core requirements. So let's talk about that. What does that mean? Um, when it comes to um, finding a job and deciding, is it worth your time? Because if you apply to a job, appropriately, it's not just hitting send. You're tweaking the resume a little bit. You're customizing it for the role. You're not using a generic resume or a generic cover letter template. And so it takes time. Um, you want to make sure that you're getting an appropriate return on the investment you're placing in that job application. And so there's an article that I'm going to ask Jenna to share right now um, that talks about the seven questions you should ask yourself uh, before you apply to a job. And I'm not going to go into every single one of those questions right now because, it, frankly, it's seven and, you know, we're running out of time. But that's the checklist you want to provide yourself before you apply to a job. Um, the most important at, at the top of the list is what are the must-have requirements? If they say you must have three to five years and you have zero, it's a waste of your time to apply for the job or at least to apply through it through traditional means because you're going to get screened out because you're not meeting the minimum requirements. Or if you're getting screened out, it could be that your resume, because if you do possess those skills and that experience, your resume is not clearly spelling that information out and saying, hey, I've got it. Um, I really say that cover letters and resumes, you got to idiot proof them. You want to make it so obvious that you possess the skills that they're looking for. And then you're also thinking about that electronic screening system um, and, and what's going on there. And, and are you formatting the resume in a way that that um, is appropriate um, for an applicant tracking system? And that's what last month's uh, office hours was all about. So um, we can share uh, the article and the infographic we did on that. You're always writing a resume for two audiences, the human live reviewer, as well as um, uh, as well as that electronic system. So we were just talking about there are several questions uh, that you should ask yourself before you apply to a job. But the number one at the top of that list is, do you meet the core must have requirements? Because if you don't, taking the time to truly 
actually customize your application and submit it, it's, it's, you're not going to get the ROI back. Um, and I would say that if you still think they're, you're a good fit and they just need to talk to you, that's when you have to leverage your network, which is why you want to invest heavily in your network. Um, just going back a few steps to some of the other mistakes that we were talking about in terms of um, communication and being prepared, when you go into a networking event, you should always have a goal in mind. Um, and, and work towards achieving that goal. And a lot of it is, are you meeting new people? Are you receiving recommendations? Um, and also, are you providing value or offering things up along the way so that you're actually building rapport with these people? So, um, Danny, if you have any um, quick thoughts on applying to unrealistic jobs, I think the biggest thing that I, I wanted to get across was ask yourself questions before you're applying to these roles. Um, and the one thing I put out there is that the job you want, there may be some stepping stone jobs along the way to ultimately getting to that job. So um, your career is, it, it, there's a long game there. It's not just quick wins all the time. And so if you know the job you want and you see the requirements and you don't necessarily have those today, go look on LinkedIn, find people who are doing the job you want and see what roles they held before that. How did they get there? And those are the jobs you should be targeting because those are the types of roles that will help you build the experience and skills that will make you a qualified and desirable candidate for that ultimate dream job. And don't yeah. be afraid to intern after college. Frankly, yeah. it's okay. If you didn't get enough internships during college, it's okay to take one after college if it's yep. going to provide you with the skills and the experience to make you attractive for the role you ultimately want. Yeah, I'll just I'll just add a couple, quick couple cents on that. I think that you know certainly there are gonna be times where you want to reach a little bit for a position that maybe like one notch above you, and some you know if a position is completely out of reach and you just do not have the standing, and you just ask yourself honestly, is this appropriate? They're asking for ten years experience. I have one, then let it go. But if it's you've been working for two years, they say three to five. Well, sometimes telling a killer story in your application is going to get them at least uh, take a, a long, hard look at you, get you in that room, get to know you face to face. And maybe you can overcome that. But again, it always comes down as we talk about, you know, number one on the list, it comes down to the writing. And if you can write your way into their good graces, you might stand a chance at a job that you were reaching for. But it always comes down to our words. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think that's very fair. Um, let's open up for Q&A now. Um, Jenna, what's our first question? So Roz joins us. And Roz? Roz, yeah. Roz, okay. Okay, it's asking when reaching out to someone on LinkedIn, if there's no email address available, and you don't have LinkedIn premium to send an email, what's the best way to contact them? Oftentimes, um, looking through Google doesn't work either. They consider sending a message through a connection request, but there's only a 300 character limit. So is this appropriate or efficient? What's the best way to go about asking them for an informational interview? Okay, so what's so if you find somebody on LinkedIn, you don't have LinkedIn premium, so you can't do an in-mail. There's no email listed. You're not finding anything on Google. How and should you contact this person um, if you're trying to request um, an informational interview? Um, okay. Well, uh, there's, there are two choices yeah. in my book. Uh, you can go on their company website, try to find their email, or you could even call the company and ask for the person's email, talk to that receptionist again, or here's the craziest idea of them all. You can straight up call the person or am I being too crazy that in this day and age, you can still find the company's phone number. The receptionist picks up, you introduce yourself, and you ask for that person, and maybe they put them on the phone. And if they say hello, that's when it's showtime. And that's when you explain your purpose, you explain how you've been reading about the company and their own background, what they've done in their career, you're really interested, you love their advice and their guidance. And if they have five to 10 minutes, you would really welcome that opportunity to meet with them or talk with them further. You know you're calling out of the blue, but you're just, you really want to learn and you're hungry. Now, who can deny that? I'll tell you right now, I wrote a book on emails and I believe very much in emails, but I get a ton accomplished by picking up the phone and cold calling people. And that is not dead. 
I can tell you right now, I have many business opportunities sitting up there in the waiting in the wings because I just call people straight out of the blue. And sometimes they're like, how did you get my number? And I'm like, I just, it was online. <laughs> I mean, I'm unapologetic, but that's how it is out there. If you want it, go get it. And sometimes the most direct way is to just catch them in the middle of their day and be ready to go. You can definitely try if you know where they work and you can look up that company's number. You can you can do that. Um, there's always the game about if you can look at that company and you can see what other email addresses do they have listed, either for a press person or something yeah. like that. It yeah. actually gives you a sense of what's the email structure and you can take yep. a guess at the person's structure. So yep. many of them are first name or first name dot last name or first letter, last name, you know, that sort of thing. So you can take a few stabs. I would also say, um, you know, in getting out of the email online technology mode of communication, um, if they are active on social media or if they have a blog or something yep. like that, Google their name. Are they going to an event? Are they speaking at an event? Yep. What are they interested in? What associations are they a part of that would make sense for you given that you want to pursue a similar career path? Go out and attend those events. Um, also, always look and see, do you know somebody who knows that person? That's why it's so, so important as you're meeting people, yep. one of the next steps after you send a nice follow-up email. And um, Danny does have some great examples online. We have an article about it on our site from him. He has more on his site and, of course, his book. Um, but how to follow up afterwards, send the connection request once you've met somebody. Always put something custom in there that reminds both you and that person how you met and when you met, right. because you can look at that. You can always reference that in years to come so right. that if you do an advanced search and that person pops up as the connection between you and someone you want to talk to, you can remind that person and jog their memory as to why they know you. Um, but always, always connect because as you build those connections, you can start using them as a tool to get to the other people. So definitely something like that. Also just see, you know, what what LinkedIn groups are they a part of? Because you could also join those groups and there may be a way to communicate with them through there as well. So mm -hmm. look for those opportunities. Um, and there's nothing wrong with a good old fashioned Google search of their name and, and email. But be careful. You also don't want to be too crazy stalker. <laughs> don't no. hack their Facebook account. Don't don't no, go. But if, they, you know, if it's an office phone number and it's. Yeah really available, you know, I look, know. I think, I think to make your way in this world, you got to be fearless. You got to say, I believe in what I'm going to do. I believe in myself. I believe in my abilities and I'm just going to go for it. And if you always start off by asking people for advice and for mentorship and guidance, it's a really harmless way to get your foot in the door somewhere. Yeah. 100% agree. Jenna, next question. True start. Ask. True shirt. Okay. Is it always a good idea to mirror the greetings that recruiters extend to us in emails? So he's asking, is it always appropriate or acceptable to mirror the greetings that they receive in the email communication that the recruiter sent them? So if the recruiter goes, hey, oh, are you allowed to be that informal or? Um, yes. Yeah. I love that question. So I've, I've written about this, uh, with particularly with uh, exclamation marks. My yeah. My approach with communication is always let the other person make the first move. I start off very formal and very professional. And if they start using emojis and exclamations and caps, then it means that they don't mind if I do it too. Mm -hmm. But I don't do it until they do it. Yes. Because I want, I want them to tell me how they prefer to communicate because everyone's different. And you can tell tone pretty quickly in somebody's email sort of communication back and forth. Let them call the shots. 100% agree. It's the same thing when you're networking and you're trying to figure out, you know, how, how to behave. Um, you, you take your cues from those around you and you take your cues from the person you're talking to. Same thing with interviewing about how much space or are they very loud or are they very animated? You can kind of figure out um, what's the right way to play it that they're going to feel some rapport with you because the, there are these unspoken communication tools you can use to, to uh, make the person feel like you get them. And same thing with, with uh, your greetings. That was a good one. What else? That's a great question. Let's see. Um, Abedan asks, when should you respond? What should you respond when they ask you um, if you are money motivated? 
What was the question? How should you respond if a recruiter asks you if you are money motivated? I'm I'm gonna pause there and say, well, it depends on what role you're going for, right? If you're if you're looking for sales roles, or you, um, I would think if somebody's asking you that question, it's typically because it's a role where they're looking for hungry people, and there's probably very little base salary and a whole lot of commission. Like a sales job. Yeah, sales job. Um, you know, somebody who wants to get into, you know, like a broker program or something like that, or a straight up sales, there's a lot of that. So I would assume that that's the nature. Frankly, you got to answer um, honestly. If you lie, it's not a good fit for you either. So you got to be honest. There, there, is, there is definitely an answer they're looking for, but it's an indication of if you would be a good fit for the role. So I would always say you got to go with, with how you honestly feel. Um, you may temper it here or there. But, you know, th that question's a loaded question for a reason. Anything you want to add there? Making an impact for your for your business. And if we do that, we'll we'll make money. Yeah. 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 I came from a company where we had two rules, um, you know, uh, love the customer. Our team wins. And the idea was you take care of the customer. And by doing so, our team will win because we're going to bring in the profits. Uh, and right. so they always went hand in hand. <laughs> exactly. Um, Trishar also wanted to know if volunteer experience should be included on the uh, resume. Okay. Um, should volunteer experience be included in a resume? Um, definitely go to Top Resume and search for for Ask Amanda or look at the Ask Amanda series because we just it might still be at the top of the blog um, because we just did an article on not only how valuable interview or volunteer experience can be on your resume, but how do you place it on your resume and where is it appropriate depending on what level you are in your career. Um, so I'm all for it as long as it's appropriate and um, you're using it to either say, hey, I've been doing other things. I haven't just been studying or twiddling my thumbs. Um, and two, volunteering and particularly something known as skill-based volunteering where you are volunteering a skill set to help a worthy cause and not just you know um you know giving money or showing up for the for the you know the car wash or something like that um, is a great way to show how you are leveraging your skill set you don't have to be paid for a job in order for that experience to be valuable and for you to be able to demonstrate that you are building skills that will be valuable for the company yeah and i think that uh you want to give as many interesting talking points for yourself as possible you don't yeah. know if you put you know race for the cure and the person on the other side of that table is also really involved in race for the cure or some other nonprofit. And then it's a connection point. So give yourself, they're going to scan the resume while you're sitting there looking for things to talk about. Yeah. So give yourself things to talk about. And it makes you more well-rounded, community engaged. It can't hurt. It might be one of your three stories that you prepare ahead of time. Is yeah, you know, exactly. Why was that important to you? How did you get involved? And what have you learned from it? Or what were you able exactly. to accomplish while you were that there? That could be like the story about the personal life. where you are talking about you know, what it means to you, an interesting experience, a moving experience. It helps to make you a well-rounded person and a job applicant. Yeah. Yeah. And um, Jobvite did a study where that was one of the top things that was considered a positive thing to display also on your LinkedIn profile. So, um, you know, it, it, what, what's on your resume also um, uh, normally translates onto your LinkedIn profile in some way, shape or form. So feel free to add that information there as well. Yep. Our final question comes okay, from Maria. And... A little bit of a shift in topic. Okay. Any special advice to the applicants who are over 50? Okay. Um, so, Maria wants to know special advice for job seekers over 50. Um, one thing I'd throw out there is that while the recent college grads are always struggling because they're always deemed underqualified for all the roles, right. being overqualified for a position is also just as damaging um, or troublesome when you're trying to apply to a job. So if they're looking for five years of experience in a particular discipline and you have 15 years of experience in that discipline, um, you are probably getting strikes against you just as if somebody applied with zero years of experience. The reason being is that they typically give a range of years because that is indicative of the level of responsibility, one, and the amount of money they're willing to pay for someone in that role. And so they're either assuming that you're going to get really bored and not stick around if you have a lot of experience um, uh, or that uh, you're uh, 
your monetary needs are going to be way outside the scope of, of their budget. So just something to keep in mind, tying back to what we were talking about with the job seekers or with the younger job seekers. Um, we are going to be doing a live chat specifically on overcoming ageism coming up in the next few months. It's tentatively slotted for July, but I'll let you know if, if that changes. Um, we're trying to, uh, you know, uh, basically jive with one of our partners to set that sucker up. So stay tuned for that. Um, and the other thing I'd say is um, reevaluate your resume and focus on the most recent 15 years for sure. Um, show what you've done recently that's relevant to the work that you're trying to do now. Don't focus on what you did way back because they want to know what you did most recently. Show us that you still have the skills and that you're you're keeping up with uh, with the trends in your market. Yep. Um, any parting words, uh, Danny, before we close in terms of we talked about the five mistakes. Is there anything that you'd really like um, the group to remember um, when they leave this live chat today? I just want you to remember that you can you can make anything happen for yourself if you're willing to willing to work at it. And if you always remember that your experiences, your own unique experiences are the best asset you ever have to sell yourself or to sell your business. Never be vague, share exactly what happened, take people into moments where you had difficulties which turned into triumphs. That's the best way to capture their attention and make them never forget you. I think that's great advice. And, and one thing I'd say that's universal to everyone is when you're a job seeker, you're a marketer. Think of it that way. Yep, Think about exactly. How are you presenting yourself? What is the message you're sending? How are you branding yourself? And is it consistent across multiple flat, uh, platforms? Because it's not just about having a great resume, which we can certainly help you with, um, but it's how do you take that information and how do you translate it on your LinkedIn profile, in your elevator pitch, as you're responding to people um, at networking events and as you're communicating with employers. So be consistent um, and always try and take it up a notch. Um, with that, I would like to heartily thank Danny Rubin, award-winning author, um, uh, for all of his help and assistance and words of wisdom today. Again, I'm going to throw it up there really quickly so everyone can see it. Um, but definitely, if you're looking for a great guide, I highly recommend uh, checking out his site, and I want to make sure it goes solo for a second. Check out his site. He has an amazing book. Wait, how do I write this email? One of my favorite resources. So please always keep it in mind. It's definitely something worth checking out. Um, also, you, if you are, um, you're quite welcome. If you are an educator and you are interested in taking some of Danny's pearls of wisdom and using in working his curriculum into uh, your organization or your college, um, you can also contact him through his site. And one thing I just want to remind everybody is that, hey, um, you're not doing this alone. There are always people out there to help you. Uh, and you don't have to struggle. If your resume is not working for you, don't feel like you have to be stuck. Um, you can always request a free resume review from Top Resume or, hey, even better, enter our contest, topresume.com, resume-makeover, and you could be one of our next winners. We're picking a winner every single month for a free makeover. So take advantage of it. Um, thank you again. And we'll see you all next month for our topic on networking. Take care, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.